seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. We're looking at some exciting events in the life of the Apostle Paul as he is on this rather harrowing missionary journey. He's run into quite a bit of opposition and of course, anytime you preach the true gospel of Christ, you will find that there are people who do not like what you have to say. Tonight, the message is entitled, Healing a Cripple on the Run. Acts chapter 14, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 10. But since we've been out of the evening studies for two weeks, I would like to read verses 1 through 4, as well as verses 5 through 10, and do a quick synopsis so that we'll get back into the picture of what's going on as Paul is traveling around and running into some of that opposition. I'll begin reading in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But... The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we begin here tonight and as we move forward into the rest of this passage, we pray that you will open our eyes to the, not only the dangers of preaching the gospel, but to the magnificent, glorious results that you always bring about when even we don't see them. We pray, Father, for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just in quick summary, you recall that the first thing that we learned from that text was that opposition to the gospel will follow every faithful man or woman no matter where they go. You cannot run away from it. It will be there. You can't hide from it. Those who hear the gospel and harden their hearts will not want you to preach that same truth anywhere else either. Not just in their presence, but as we see here, they begin to track and trail Paul and Barnabas. They're not very happy about the fact that he preached in Iconium, but we're going to discover that they follow them on to other cities where they continue to raise persecution. Verses 6 and 19 make that very, very clear. In Lystra and in Derbe, the region of Lacaonia, the original persecutors from Antioch of Pisidia came along, they came to Iconium, they picked up more people in Iconium who were opposed to the gospel. They followed Paul and Barnabas to Lystra and to Derbe. And as you know from a little bit later in the text, though we'll not get that far tonight, they finally catch up with the Apostle Paul and they stone him. The Lord willing, we'll be talking about that next week. It's rather interesting to note that as they left the city, they did not merely shake off the dust against Lystra, Derby, and Iconium as they had done at Antioch and Pisidia. They had shaken the dust off their feet in accordance with what Jesus had taught back in the Gospels. But here they did not do it, although the opposition was stronger. And I suspect that that was because the opposition did not originate in that particular city. It had originated in Antioch prior to this point, and people from that city had come and caused the trouble. The third thing that we noted was that it's of interest that Paul not only preached, but Barnabas also preached here in that city. He didn't merely sit on the sidelines cheering for the Apostle Paul. Many of us would like the, the role of the cheerleaders on the sidelines, but it says they spoke. Plural form used in the Greek there. Both were involved in the preaching, and so we don't get the wrong idea that only the Apostle Paul could have had results that we see taking place. The fourth thing that we learned as we looked at those first four verses, when the Holy Spirit begins to do a work of power, Satan immediately raises opposition. And he always has his people in every locale under his control. It's true here in Collingswood. It's true in all the little cities around us. It's true in Philadelphia. It was true there. Some of the cities that we're going to look at tonight were quite small towns. They were out in the middle of nowhere. But 
Satan raised up opposition in those places and had some of his key people in those places. We'll find there was a temple of Jupiter, or Zeus as the Greeks called him, uh, as the Apostle Paul moves into this new region. Satan always is there to oppose. We saw that the unbelieving Jews did two things. Two different words are used. Number one, they stirred up. That's uh, wherever uh, that word is found. It means causing agitation. It also talks about those Jews there making up their minds evil affected against the brethren. We find that what they're doing is planting seeds of doubt, planting seeds of bitterness, planting seeds perhaps of, of anger and hatred for what Paul and Barnabas are doing. They're poisoning the minds of those who have been listening to the Apostle Paul. But then we saw in verse 3 a very interesting tiny word. It's the word, therefore. The opposition did not cause Paul to back down. Instead, it says, long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord. Because of the opposition, they continued to preach the word. Most of us, when we have opposition, tend to back down from what we're about to say. But here it says, long time, therefore, abode they preaching, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Interesting because they're in opposition to those who are teaching salvation by law. They're in opposition to those who are teaching by salvation by works to the pagan gods. And they're preaching the word of grace. How God has provided for sinners through no works of their own, but by the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. Paul extended his stay at Iconium because of the opposition, and it says they were speaking boldly. That's the same thing that we saw in Acts 13, 46, when it says Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken unto you, but seeing he put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You've made the choice, and every one of us makes choices as we go through life. You have judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. It's not merely a, well, I'll put it off till tomorrow. What you're doing when you reject the gospel of Christ, you are judging yourself unworthy of everlasting life, and that will be held against you when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ someday. Opposition merely made the gospel message more urgent here, and that's why at each location the opposition got more vicious. The opponents were desperately trying to find a method that would actually make Paul and Barnabas stop. They finally catch up with them at Lystra and Derby, and they stone the apostle Paul. They figure that will make him stop. If you can't stop the message, kill the messenger. Remember that when you preach the gospel there may be a price. Remember, it may cost you your life. It's costing believers their lives right now at many places around this world. They're standing against opposition that is far more vicious, far more bitter, far more angry, far more virulent, far more demonstrative and open than the opposition that you have ever faced. And they're boldly proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. They know it may cost them something. It's costing some of them imprisonment. Right now you have brothers and sisters in prison because of their faith and proclamation of the gospel of Christ. You have brothers and sisters who are facing execution as we speak. You're facing brothers and sisters, or they are facing, those who would seek to assassinate them. You're facing a situation here in the United States which is nothing like that, being faced by our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. They have family members who are plotting to kill them. Do you understand the freedom that we have here? We see what's happening in other parts of the world as we look at what happened to Paul here, and it may here happen someday as well. When you're in the center of God's will, he gives more grace. We sang it a few moments ago. As the opposition increases and as the burdens grow greater, as that hymn just proclaimed for us. The last thing that we noted was that the preaching of the cross always makes a clear and distinct line 
between believers and unbelievers. The multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part held with the apostles. Jesus promised it would happen, so don't be surprised when it does happen. Now tonight, healing a cripple on the run, we move into verse 5. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lacaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Paul didn't just whisper it and hope that it would happen. <laughs> Paul had an audience around him. When he proclaimed it with a loud voice, if it didn't happen, everybody would have laughed and walked away from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul knew that he was speaking with the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back for just a second and think for a moment. In Iconium, Paul began at the synagogue, as he always did in the various places that he went, if it was possible. He started at the synagogue because there was a base of people who already knew the Old Testament scriptures. People who, if they came to Christ, would then be able to understand the Old Testament scriptures and expound them in light of New Testament gospel. It would also be a place where Paul could send others, converts, from the outside to go and be established in their faith. And so he had done at Iconium when he had gone first to the synagogue. Apparently, as we look at the text here, he was able at least to continue in the synagogue for a short time because of the numbers of converts who had continued to fill the synagogue after that. However, when he was forced out of the city, they apparently resorted, he and Barnabas, to open air preaching at Lystra. Because there's no mention of a synagogue at Lystra. In fact, archaeologists have not discovered any synagogues in that area. Only the pagan temple and priests of Jupiter, as we see in the next few verses. Paul did not waste precious opportunities just because his original methodology was not available in that place. What's the lesson we should learn from that? Number one lesson. We should not be so stuck on methodology and form that we fail to fulfill the function of our calling to preach the gospel. Let me give you simple illustrations. For example, if a church building is not available, use a public forum like a park. If a public forum is not available, use radio. If radio is not available, use tracks. If tracks are not available, use invitations to your home and so on. The method is not the most important thing. It's the message that is important and we are obligated to carry that message even when a particular form is not available to us. We cannot say, well, I guess since we don't have a church building, we're not under any obligation to continue proclaiming the gospel. I think the second lesson that we learn out of this text tonight is also obvious. We are not required to wait until somebody beats us up or tries to lock us in jail. When serious opposition arises that seeks to silence the message by killing or jailing the messenger, it seems from this text and many others in the book of Acts that it's perfectly permissible to run to a safe location if at all possible. Paul did this on many occasions in this book of Acts. Sometimes he got caught, other times he got away. He got away from Damascus by being let down in a basket over a wall. He got caught in the next few verses here in our text and got stoned. And I believe he died and he mentions that and was raised again from the dead. We'll talk about that in the Gospels that are the epistles that he writes, but we'll talk about that when we get to that passage. There's a corollary to this earlier. Earlier in the book of Acts, we saw that the early Christians had some sort of what used to be called the dew line. Those of you who are older, do you remember the dew line? The distant early warning system. That was the dew line, where we had uh, strategic bombers flying around in the north to see if there were any missiles coming in from Cuba. 
That was the dew line. Well, apparently the Christians, as we've seen in the early chapters, had some kind of a warning system that they had set up among themselves. They knew when Saul was coming to Damascus. It's very clear from the comments that are made by Ananias when God tells him, I want you to go and to this house on the street called Straight, and there's a guy there that, oh, I know about him, Lord. We've heard all about the things that he's been doing in Jerusalem, locking Christians up and so on. I really don't want to do that, Lord. Do you know who this guy really is? <laughs> the Christians did have some kind of a system that was going on. We don't know it exactly. We find the Apostle Paul knew through his nephew about the plot to assassinate him as we get to a few chapters later in the book of Acts. I think there's nothing wrong with keeping your ear to the ground, so to speak, to know when the enemy is coming. Persecuted Christians in China, communist countries, Muslim countries, Hindu countries, and other dangerous areas do it all the time. Only American Christians seem to be oblivious to what is going on around them. The third lesson is this. Satan will always try to organize the opposition, even if the parties normally hate each other. Did you pick it up on the text? In this passage, the Gentiles actually join with the Jews and the rulers to kill the Christians. Now, Jews and Gentiles don't normally mix. This morning, as we were taking the Lord's table, I read that passage out of Luke that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod when he found out that Jesus was from Herod's jurisdiction, which was Galilee. After Herod mocked Jesus, he sent him back to Pilate. The text specifically says that up until that time, Herod and Pilate hated each other, but after they had this interchange in persecuting Christ, they became friends with one another. Luke 23, 11 and 12, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Even when Satan's little minions squabble among themselves, when they have the common enemy of Christ, they will gladly join together as friends. Historically, another example of this is that the Arab states have hated each other and warred with each other, but when they have Israel, God's chosen people, as their enemy, they work together. In World War II, the Nazis worked together with the Vatican, not only to kill Jews, but also Protestants and Bible-believing Christians. I think you get the picture. If you believe the Word of God, and if you proclaim the Word of God, Satan will organize his forces, although they may be different in their goals, they will have one goal when they focus on you as a Christian. The next observation in our text tonight brings us back to what I call the structure of the book of Acts. In the first half of the book of Acts, we see Peter performing various miracles. In the second half, we see Paul performing the same type of miracles. I think the point that is being made by the Holy Spirit as these things have been recorded is that Paul has as much apostolic authority and power as Peter does. In Acts chapter 3, for example, Peter also heals a lame man. But in the Acts 3 passage, it was the healing of a Jewish lame man. In this second instance in our text tonight, it's the healing of a Gentile lame man. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. There are also many other contrasts. In the first instance, there is no faith of the cripple involved. In the second instance, the faith of the cripple is specifically mentioned. In the first instance, it's right outside the Jewish temple. In our narrative tonight, it's right outside the pagan Roman temple of Jupiter, or Zeus, as the Greeks called him. Let me just remind you of that narrative in Acts chapter 3, because it is very instructive how the Holy Spirit paralleled things that went on in Acts chapter 3 with the things that are going on here in Acts chapter 14. Beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, 
seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And you know the rest of the text and the magnificent sermon that Peter has the opportunity to preach before finally in chapter 4 of the Sanhedrin gets its act together and sends officers to arrest Peter and John. Now let me give you some of the contrasts that we see between the two passages. In the first instance, Peter, John was present there. In the second instance with Paul, Barnabas was present. In the first instance, Peter and John were going to the temple for prayer. In the second instance, Paul and Barnabas were doing open-air street preaching. You see, God can do the same kind of thing, but in different contexts, in different ways, in different ministries, with different people, even if it's the same type, in this case, of a miracle. Another contrast, in the first instance, the cripple was a beggar who spoke first to Peter, begging for an alms. In the second instance, Paul was preaching to a crowd in a loud voice, and happened to notice the cripple listening. In the first instance, there's no mention of faith of the beggar. In fact, it says that when Peter told him to pay attention, he was expecting money and nothing else. A very low goal, I would say, for the current contact, who would then be forgotten as the beggar focused on his next potential donor. In the second instance, the cripple is apparently already beginning to believe Paul's message because when Paul sees him, God gives Paul insight that this is a man who has the faith to be healed. In the first instance, Peter is able to preach an extended sermon after the healing. In the second instance, the healing is followed almost immediately by an assault on the Apostle Paul. In the first instance, the healed man holds on to Peter and John as they enter the temple. In the second instance, Paul definitely did not enter the pagan temple, and no mention is made of the lame man holding on to Paul. In the first instance, Peter was on sacred Jewish ground. In the second instance, it appears that Paul and Barnabas were somewhere around the city gate. We'll be seeing that in the next few verses. In the first instance, Peter took the lame man by the hand and pulled him upright. In the second instance, Paul merely commanded the lame man to stand up. God is not required to use the same mechanism every time he does something. We tend to get stuck on mechanisms, on the mechanics, on this work before, so we got to do it this way the next time. God is not bound by human mechanics. You may remember a number of years ago there was a campaign called I Found It. There were billboards all over the United States and then, you know, Later, there were additional things that were added to it, and this big telephone campaign went on where people who were Christians were calling at random all the different phone numbers in their telephone books and going through a series of questions, and if the person said yes, they would go down this line. If the person said no, they would go down this line. Sort of like your tax forms when you're trying to figure out whether you have a tax deduction or not. If you answer yes to the question, then you skip this. Uh, but if you answer no to the question, then you have to do this. And you get to a point where it says stop. And so this campaign was very mechanical and claimed that they were leading thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people to Christ because they answered the yes-no questions correctly and in the end, quote, they were saved. Some perhaps were. But if really those thousands and thousands and thousands were saved by a mechanical means, 
and were really saved, then where are they today? With that many new Christians eager and excited for the word of God, would there not have been a greater revival in the United States than the decadence and depravity that we see surrounding us today? People don't get stuck on mechanics. It is the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You will find a way in which you are comfortable approaching someone and witnessing to them, but remember, it's not the mechanics that saves them. It is the gospel of Christ that penetrates the darkness of the unregenerate human heart. And it is the Holy Spirit taking the word of God that reaches into the darkness and turns on the light. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by our mechanics. We do see some similarities in this contrast between Acts 3 and Acts 14. In both instances, the healing was done in public. In both instances, the healing was of a person that was known by the bystanders. In other words, there was not a fake healing going on like in some of the modern charismatic meetings. A number of years ago, back in the 20s, there were a good number of uh, the Pentecostal and charismatic types that were running around the country performing miracles, so-called. But someone decided they would follow them from place to place and see what was going on. And they discovered that the same people were coming forward and getting healed at each of the charismatic meetings or each of the Pentecostal meetings. Charismatic movement hadn't actually taken hold at that point. Charismatics are interdenominational. Pentecostals were a specific brand of Christians. No fake healings going on here. These are people well known, these two cripples, to the people at the location where the cripples were found. There was a man who had been for 40 years being carried by his friends to beg for money at the beautiful gate of the temple and people walked by him every day of the week. They knew him. Some of them probably walked on the other side they thought, I gave something to that guy last week. I bet he's really getting rich, man. Look at all the people dropping stuff into his little bucket there. There's still beggars like that in Jerusalem today. I can remember going to the Garden Tomb in 1966 and walking by the, down that little narrow street before you get to the door that opens into the Garden Tomb area. And there was a, a bigger woman that was sitting there. And as she held out her cup, she grinned. And she had solid gold teeth. I thought that cost something. <laughs> I went back years later. There's still beggars there. It's a place where... Christians feeling very, very emotionally related to the Lord Jesus Christ will drop something into the cup. These people know where to sit. Wasn't sitting someplace where nobody ever comes by. The people knew that beggar. Here is another man who is crippled sitting on the sidelines of the gates of the city. A good place to ask people for donations. When Paul begins to preach. And as Paul is preaching in a loud voice, Paul perceives that this man has faith to be healed. It's a man who is suddenly responding to the gospel message that Paul has. And Paul says in a loud voice, Okay, to, today is your day. Stand up. Stand up. And the man stands up begins to walk and everybody marvels. In fact, they are so excited, so thrilled about it, that the priests of the Temple of Jupiter say, man, we never saw anything like that. It must be the gods have come down to us. And they bring garlands and oxen, and we'll talk about this next week, out to sacrifice them to Paul and Barnabas. The people knew who these men were. It was not a fake healing. The third thing that's a similarity in both instances, it is a man, an adult male, that was healed. In both cases, it was a man who was lame from birth, an impossible situation. In both cases, it states that it was a man who had never walked 
He hadn't been able to even hobble along at any time. In both cases, there is no mention of praying for healing for either of these men. Healing by prayer is available according to the will of God today if the sickness is due to sin. We find that in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. But we don't find any of that here in either of our texts. James 5.13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. None of that is going on here in this passage. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, and as you know, I've preached on this before, uh, that's one of the conditional clauses in Greek that indicates if and it is so, he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's squarely in the epistles. That's not back in the gospels. That's not in the transitional period of the book of Acts. That's something that deals with it today. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's not a healing there, but that's a demonstration of the power of prayer in the will of God. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, he goes back to what he had been talking about, which is the prayer of faith. If any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. It's not only moral error by which a man is sick and about to die, but doctrinal error too. If any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. There is a sin unto death, and we've talked about that also in the past. We'll not cover it again tonight. So back to our text now. Here's a question for you. Was running away from the assault and hiding and then street preaching and later being stoned and having public humiliation, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Sounds like this is kind of a, an aborted missionary journey going on here. Was it worth it? All right, let's remember where this took place. It's at Lystra. Consider the following facts. Number one, Lystra and Derby are south and southeast of Iconium at the foot of a very giant mountain known today as the Karadag, or that's Turkish, it means Black Mountain. In that area, archaeologists have found the ruins of more than 40 early churches, which in the Turkish language, this area is called 40. That's a lot. Now listen to this. But you know this area, what it's called? It's called Bin Bir Kilisa. You know what that means? The 1001 churches. <laughs> Do you think a revival took place in this area? The Turks refer to it historically as the area of the 1,001 churches. Was Paul's suffering for the proclamation of the gospel worth it? Number two, there were only a few Jews in this region historically, and thus no synagogue, but there was one Jewish young man in this area that is of particular note. Now we're going to see that Paul is stoned in the next few verses. We find him traveling a short distance to Derby, and then he comes back to Lystra, and then to Iconium, and then to Antioch. It tells us that he made this loop out, and then he made this loop back. And on his return trip, we discover a certain Jewish woman had been converted, apparently on the initial trip when Paul was stoned at Lystra. She had heard him preach. She got converted. And she had a son. Listen to what we read about her and him in chapter 16, just two chapters from where we are. Acts 16.1 Then he came to Derby and Lystra. Remember, that's the place he was preaching, where he got grabbed, where he got stoned. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. 
Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And we talked about that issue of circumcision this morning. Why did Paul circumcise Timothy and not circumcise Titus? There was an important person in the sovereign plan of God that had to be reached at Lystra and Derby. Timothy had both a mother and a grandmother who were believers who taught him as a child the Jewish scriptures. When Timothy heard the word preached by Paul, he too became convinced that Jesus was his Messiah. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. You can read all the commentaries that you want. They'll all come to the conclusion that Timothy was a convert of the Apostle Paul. Timothy lived in Lystra. Timothy came to Christ under the preaching ministry of the Apostle Paul. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my fathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Was what Paul suffered at Lystra worth it? Here was a young man whom Paul loved in the faith, whom he'd led to Christ, and whom he saw great potential for the next generation. He thought about Timothy all the time and what Timothy needed. Oh, how he prayed for Timothy. I have remembrance of my prayers day and night. Timothy was constantly coming to Paul's mind, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Unfeigned means genuine. It's not fake. Which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Young Jewish woman should not have married a Gentile. Different interesting culture back then. Apparently fathers both at the grandfather level and the father level were not believers. Somehow the grandmother had gotten involved in a situation whereby the, her daughter married a Gentile. She perhaps also was married to a Gentile, but believed the Jewish scriptures. And that daughter was the mother of Timothy. And his mother had taught him what she knew. She didn't have the New Testament yet. She didn't have the Gospel of Christ yet. She had the Old Testament scriptures. And when her little boy Timothy was born, she began to teach him the Jewish scriptures. And then the Apostle Paul comes to town. And God, in his sovereignty of making our lives intersect at key points, and we talked about that this morning, how God makes people's lives intersect at precisely the right time, at precisely the right location, at precisely the right spiritual condition. We saw it with Moses and Aaron this morning. We've seen it in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. There are no mistakes in the plan of God. God brings your life into intersection with the lives of others every day of the week. Are you alert to what God is doing as he makes them cross your path? Do you understand your responsibility if God brings them into your life of making sure that they hear the gospel of Christ? And Paul comes to town and begins to preach. And Paul looks over and sees a crippled man and perceives that he has faith to believe and that man does believe and he is healed. But there's a crowd that's listening. And in the crowd, there are people who are being irresistibly drawn to Christ, and there are people who are all excited because they think this is a pagan god come down and walking among them, and go and get the priests, the local priests of Jupiter, and come out to try to offer sacrifices to Paul, and we'll talk about that next week, when, when Paul says in Barnabas, running among the crowd, saying, no, no, don't, don't, we're just men, don't, don't sacrifice anything to us. 
And there was in that crowd somebody, a young woman, who heard the message, and she had a little boy with her, perhaps at this point a teenager, we don't know exactly how old he was. And they heard, and they believed, and they watched the Apostle Paul be stoned. And they had great grief in their hearts, and Paul mentions Timothy's tears here. And as the disciples stand around, he's raised again. And continues his journey out, and on his way back, there's this young man who has a good report of all the brethren. And Paul thinks, I need somebody like that to go with me on my missionary journeys. Was it worth it? The faithful stand for Christ no matter what it costs. Was it worth it? Verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy had seen what happens when you preach the gospel. And Paul has to remind him, God has not given us the spirit of fear, phobos, terror, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear will destroy all three of those. Fear will make you weak. It will destroy power. Fear destroys love. Perfect love, John tells us, casts out fear. Fear destroys a sound mind. You will not make correct decisions if you are afraid. Remember talked about Paul and Barnabas were speaking boldly. Every place they went, they spoke boldly. They had the truth. They were not afraid to proclaim the truth. They knew what would happen, but they knew it was the truth. You have it. You have the truth. What are you doing with the truth? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Written to young Timothy from Lystra. To young Timothy who saw the Apostle Paul be stoned, who heard Paul's words, who trusted in the Messiah that Paul proclaimed. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker, now listen, of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. I wish we had time to cover the rest of 2 Timothy, even if in a nutshell, don't have time for it tonight. But remember this. Read the rest of 2 Timothy, Paul's farewell, to see how he encourages young Timothy to be strong in the face of persecution. And remember what Paul went through where Timothy was born and raised. It's a great testimony. Let me ask that question again. Was it worth it? Do you realize that two books of the New Testament were a specific result of Paul's ministry in the place where he was stoned? First and Second Timothy. Was it worth it? Those two books have been the touchstone for thousands of young preachers over the past 2,000 years. Was it worth it? As you answer that question, remember what we've studied about divinely planned intersections in our lives this morning. When Paul suffered at Iconium and Lystra and Derby, was it worth it? You will never know the results of your life and ministry until you look back at the people that God has allowed you to touch. The people who then faithfully continue that ministry in your place as faithful men. Pass on to faithful men. Pass on to faithful men. Pass on to faithful men until it has reached us today. That which thou hast heard of me, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Was it worth it? I think we must all answer 
Yes. And we sit here today as a result of a few men who are willing to count the cost and to rejoice as they did so. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this portion of your word that we've heard tonight. Only this small group of people, and perhaps a few on the internet, will have heard it tonight because this poor preacher forgot to turn on either the DVD recorder or the CD recorder. And so these are the only ones who have heard it. It's been passed on to a few. I pray, Father, that it will be to those who are faithful with what they have heard to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight.